Hello and welcome. This is your 9 p.m. daily quiz. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all today's session where we will be discussing the most important news stories of the day from the prelims examination point of view. If you are new here, please do hit the subscribe button as well. And if this video helps in any way whatsoever, please do hit the like button as well. That will help us increase the reach of this video. Also, if you are new and you don't know how to get the PDF of all these classes, I upload the PDFs on a weekly basis on my own Telegram channel. The link to join that channel again is in the description of the video. You can also download my app from the link given in the description of the video. The app is called Harshmi Study Circle that has a bunch of other courses that I offer. PSI are optional courses, personal mentorship programs for mains dance writing, prelims and much much more. Let's begin then with the very first question. Consider the following statements with regards to Article 30 of the Indian Constitution. Number one. The protection under Article 30 is confined only to minorities, religious or linguistic, and does not extend to any other section of the citizens. Second, currently only those communities notified under Section 2C of the National Commission for Minorities Act 1992 by the central government are regarded as minorities. Third, in 1993, five religious minorities, that is Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, were notified as minority communities. In 2014, the Buddhists were also notified as a minority community. How many of these statements are correct? Now, this is an important question because Article 29 and Article 30 are continuously and very frequently asked by the UPSC in the prelims and the mains examination. Article 30 is specifically a minority community right, giving them the right to administer and establish their own education institutions. First and second are correct. Third statement is wrong. When the first five minorities were notified, Buddhists was one of them. It was the Jains that were notified as minorities in 2014. So in 2014, the list became six. The sixth one, that is Jains, were added in 2014. First and second are correct. Remember, there is no definition of minorities in the constitution. The constitution mentions the word minority but does not define it. It is defined by the central government under National Commission for Minorities Act of 1992. The reason why we are asking this question is because of a news in today's Indian Express. Outstanding Stephen's College may have exceeded the approved quota for Christian students as per the administration of the Delhi University. Next question number two. Who amongst the following are eligible to vote through postal ballots in India? One, special voters, which includes President of India, Vice President, Governors and others. Second, Service voters, which include members of armed forces, paramilitary forces, government employees deployed on election duty, far from their home constituencies. Third, electors on election duty, so for example, school principals, government officers who are on election duty. And fourth, electors who are under preventive detention. How many of these can vote through postal ballot? Now, as you know, postal ballot means you send your vote by a post. When the voting, when the counting occurs, these are usually the first votes that are counted. After that, the EVM machines are opened up. So who among these are eligible to get this special facility of postal ballot? The answer here is all these. All of them are, and some more are category of people who are eligible to vote through postal ballot in India. The answer here thus is D. The reason why we're discussing this question is again because of an article in the Indian Express about how there are Insights coming in that postal ballot may have moved away from BJP after 2019. So in the recent election, more people from the postal ballot may have voted for parties against the BJP. Next question number three. Consider the following statements with regards to digital agriculture mission. One, farmers will be given a digital identity called farmer ID similar to Aadhaar. Which will, which will be linked dynamically to the records of land, ownership of livestock, crops, sown, demographic details, family details, schemes, benefits availed, etc. Second, the crop sown registry will provide details of crops planted by the farmers. And third, under the mission, detailed soil profile maps on a scale of 1 to 10,000 of about 142 million hectares of agricultural land are envisaged to be prepared. How many of these are correct? Now, the digital agriculture mission is a very ambitious project of the government of India to ensure that we have as many details and key data points about agriculture sector in India as possible, including details about individual farmers, giving them identity, helping the government to identify those farmers, the record of the agriculture land, what is grown where, 
soil profile map so that the government can identify which crops are best suited for which area and a lot more. All that will be a part of digital agriculture mission. All these three statements are correct in this regard. The answer here is a C. There have been a lot of articles on digital agriculture mission. I recommend you to read at least a couple of them in detail to understand this topic. The Hindu newspaper today has this very important article. You can read this to understand the in and out of this mission. The article is titled Plan for the Farms. Next question number four. Consider the following statements with regards to unified lending interface by RBI. One. The lenders would gain access to consumer data from various silos, including government databases, satellite imagery, through standardized APIs. Second, fintechs can gain access to a variety of lenders on one platform and unlock opportunities to provide deeper customer insights. Third, for a dairy farmer seeking a loan, the lender can find data from milk cooperatives to know about cash flows, land ownership status from land records of state, and insights into his financial condition through farming patterns. How many of these are correct? Now, just like the digital agriculture mission, another extremely interesting initiative from the side of the government, from the side of the government, is Unified Lending Interface by RBI. As the name suggests, it is about ensuring that lending becomes easier. That is easier to lend money. And for the lender specifically, when you go to a bank, they require many, many documentation from you. They require a proof of your ownership, they require a proof of your income, they require a proof of many other things. They want to ensure that all that data that is being given to them is authentic. With that, unified lending interface can be extremely helpful. So the lenders can be you or the lenders can connect to the institutions and they can get this data about them from various government databases and other institutes. All the three statements here are correct. The answer here is C, all three. Again, there is a detailed article about this in the Hindu newspaper today. What is the unified lending interface by RBI? Do read that as well. Next question number five. The Republic of Dagestan was recently in the news. It is located in Finland, Russia, China or Mongolia. The Republic of Dagestan. It was in the news a few weeks back. The answer here is B, Russia. Dagestan is a, a majority Muslim population region in Russia. It is in the southern tip of Russia and it has been seeing militancy for a long time now. There are various demands from the people of this particular region. The Russian government is not adhering to most of the demands and that is why there are issues. There have been many protests against the Russian government and the armed forces. That is why it remains in the news a few weeks back. It was covered in the Indian Express why Dagestan remains a restive republic in Russia. This brings to the end of the session, but at the end, I have an important infographic for you as always. The government recently shared seven schemes to improve farmers' lives and increase their income. Here is a summarized version of all these seven. I'm giving you infographic. You can read this from the PPT. This is the first scheme, the Data Agriculture Mission. Then we have the crop science for food and nutritional security. The government has given details of all of these. Sending agriculture education, management, social sciences. Sustainable livestock health. Sustainable development of horticulture. And in the end, sending Krishi Vigyan Kendra and natural resource management. All these are initiatives of the government that you can quote very easily in the mains examination. When there's a question about the government initiatives on agriculture. This was our session for the day. I hope you learned something new. If you did, do hit the like button as well. I'll see you tomorrow in the next one. Till then, take care of yourself. Bye-bye.